G'day and welcome to the Head Shepherd Podcast. I'm your host, Mark Ferguson, CEO at Next and Agri. At the Head Shepherd Podcast, we focus on all things livestock through the stories of the people that farm them and the people that study them and work with them on a daily basis. We get to work in amazing locations like I am today at Glenthorne Station here in the South Island of New Zealand. At Next and Agri, our tagline is farming in our hearts, science in our heads. And we live that out every day and you'll certainly hear that coming out in the Head Shepherd podcast. Before we start today's episode, I really do want to thank again Allflex, our sponsors, and now the MSD team for continuing to support our podcast. It really is fantastic to have such a great, great collaboration. And the combined forces is pretty exciting for Australasian agriculture. The science of, of healthier animals through through ID and, and through the through the animal health products like the Cooper's Range, which is an MSD product that we might be more familiar with. Fantastic to have such a close alignment with those two companies now. Just really exciting to continue Head Shepherd. We've, we've gone past our 50 episodes. We're into season five now. Fantastic to see the podcast continue to grow. Thank you to all those that continue to support us and, and give us feedback. It's, it's really is awesome. We better get on with the show. Welcome back to the Head Shepherd Podcast. Before we get underway this week, I just wanted to mention our Farm Fit You workshops that are running across the South Island from the 1st to the 4th of November. Um, a great opportunity to come out and, and hone those skills in, in managing sheep nutrition and as well as getting your head around uh, that ram buying, ram buying job that's right in front of us for many of us. Um, just the kind of traits you need to be looking for, how you're comparing rams across different properties. And, uh, and how you go about building that great ram team and, and also the ewes that, that match them. So yeah, great opportunity, four or five hours uh, at each of our locations, starting near Cheviot at the Gums, through to Cleardale and the Kai Gorge, down to Benmore uh, near Amarama, and then finally to Ernsclue uh, near Alexandra. Obviously all five more properties, but uh, we're gonna cover material that's relevant, whether you're breeding Romneys or or merinos or everything in between uh, that's we're going to we're going to cover off so we'd love to see see some of you there um certainly come up and say good day if you are there and and mention that you've, you've listened to the podcast uh this week on the podcast we're talking teasing or we're talking all things reproduction but we're, we're talking to graham martin who uh is, has spent his lifetime really understanding the reproduction of mammals so absolute pleasure to have graham on the show and really looking forward to this chat welcome back to head shepherd Really excited this week to have Emeritus Professor Graham Martin on the show. Welcome, Graham. Thanks. Thanks, Mark. Graham, you've got a, a long and distinguished career in, in reproduction. I think I read something like 350 refereed papers, 40 PhD students, um, a whole heap of other other titles to, to hold. Uh, I guess I guess we'd want to take it right back to start with as to where it all began and, and sort of what yeah how that career panned out and what your interests have been. Okay, th- yeah, I, I, we can do that. I mean, you've done some research on the data, so we can ignore the data, which is good. Um, <laughs> well, I began as a, as a farmer's son, right? So my father was a, a farmer, sheep and wheat. Uh, and then I sort of ended up at university and did a degree in agricultural science at UWA. I uh, did my PhD here in the area of reproduction. Uh, then I worked in France for a couple of years in my first postdoc. Then in Scotland for a few years, in my second postdoc before, uh, before I was offered a job back in West Australia and my wife accepted. So we came back here, um, in the mid eighties and I, I was at that time working for both CSIRO and the university. And I did that for about six or seven years and then I became full time at the university. Uh, so since then, um, I, I really focused on uh, reproduction in sheep in particular and, 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 and in particular also on today's topic, which is the, the male effect, um, and teasing. Uh, so investigating how it works, uh, trying to find ways to make it better. And of course, you need to understand how it works if you are going to make it better. So those two, two things went hand in hand. And, uh, I had a lot of help from people like Penny Hawken and Dominic Blash, uh, over the years. So, so that's where I am uh, now that I've retired. Um, I'm thinking more and more about how I can use this information to improve uh, sheep management. Cool, thank you. So, yeah, I guess 
it's yeah, it was well before my research career began when when you were sort of understanding the the reproduction axes and trying to understand what is going on so I guess we've yeah we have got a lot of interest in the the male effect and and how teasing works and why it works can you sort of take us through a, a cook's tour of what's happening in the sheep's brain yeah sure so so we, we in the sheep's brain the sheep well the sheep is, is much cleverer than most people give it credit for it effectively spends its whole day uh, measuring its environment it measures the length of the night it measures uh, the amount of food that's available it measures its body reserves um, but also, and in particular, it measures uh, its social surroundings, right? basically by using smell. And so uh, the, the sense of smell in the female sheep responds to an odour from a male sheep, and this switches on the reproductive system. Now, there are limitations to this, okay? It, it can't do it. It does it pr- primarily and most effectively when the animals are not cycling normally. So basically that means, for example, in the period between September and, and January for merino sheep in Australia. And, and it works most effectively in merino sheep. We're really lucky that we've got so many merinos in Australia because they really are the best animals for, for the ram effect or for, for teasing. And so what happens then is that the, the female sheep is just wandering around the place and then suddenly she smells uh, a new male. Now, this is something we've discovered quite recently, that it needs to be a new male, a novel male something she hasn't smelled before, or maybe she has, but she's forgotten because it was like 12 months ago. And so when she smells this smell, her her brain switches on within seconds, really, and two days later she'll ovulate and produce an egg. She won't come on heat with that first ovulation, uh, but she'll go through a a cycle and then the second ovulation, uh, she will show heat and, and can be mated. So that's sort of 19 days after after teaser introduction or male introduction. Of course, entire rams can also be teasers as well as the tra- traditional teasers, which used to be in my day, uh, testo-injected weathers. So uh, there is a little bit of a, a catch here in that uh, after that first ovulation in the first two days, about half of the animals seem to have a short cycle, only about six or seven days instead of 17 days. And they had their second ovulation there for it around about nine days. And there's no estrus there either. So it's another silent ovulation. So the first two ovulations from those animals are silent. And then they have their third ovulation at about day 21 and they come on heat. So you've got, you've got a sort of peak of activity of, of sexual behavior between days 19 and 25 in that period of time there, which is when you want to have your rams in, in really good nick and, and, uh, and so on and have everything all planned out. You'll get, uh, you know, if you have a good percentage of rams, a strong percentage of rams, this is something we probably need to talk about, um, you, you'll get probably 70 or 80% of the animals pregnant at that time, which you can then verify later on uh, at ultrasound. And this gives you a nice concentrated landing. Uh, you know, there's a debate about whether you should have the rams present for longer than that, go for a second cycle. That's an individual decision. Uh after the second cycle, you know, so into the 30 days after the rams have gone in, you don't get much benefit from leaving the rams in, so it's probably better to pull them out and just keep a concentrated lambing and a nice cohort coming through from market. So that's how it works. Yeah, awesome. So that short cycle, so that's why the recommendation kind of is a 14-day because nothing will be back cycling. You should have got rid of those, both those silent estruses after a 14-day teasing, and then you've got to have the entire rams in before that next round start cranking up again. That's exactly right. So if you're going to use teasers, which are vasectomized rams or testo weathers or something, uh, they're only necessary for the first 14 days. Uh, 14 days is nice because remembering that's Tuesday, so it's Tuesday, Tuesday, (laughs) right? So you get the the teasers out and you put the real rams in. Um, The real rams will have some teasing effect themselves because they're they're now new animals, right? They're new males. Oh, yeah. And that's really quite nice. Uh, and then they will do the work over the next 10 days or so. And, uh, again, you can just use two weeks because it's more convenient. And then there's a decision about when you pull them out, which is, uh, it depends a lot on if you had a perfect world and you could actually, uh, mark, you could, if you had crowns on all the rams, you could see how many animals have been marked. You could say, right, I've got, I've, I've been successful or not. And then, then replan, uh, if it's been unsuccessful. But generally speaking, it's pretty reliable in, in that. That two weeks of, of RAM presence is probably all you need, really. Yeah. 
And so if you happen to harness those teasers, you shouldn't be disheartened if they're not doing anything because actually nothing's having a, a show in Estrus. There's very little value in harnessing the teasers. Yeah. You'll get, you get, you get, you get very few animals going out here, except the animals that didn't go out of season, right? And there are always a few in merinos. Yeah. Well, there's always probably 5% of the, of the whole flock that sort of will be like ovulating anyway. Yeah. Uh, not be marked, but, but really – uh, they're not of a major consequence in terms of how teasing works. They'll get pregnant as they go through the system anyway. Yeah, yeah. We all have in our heads this 17-day cycle, and that's mm. obviously an average, not the rule. What's the range in in the sort of tempo of ovulation? It's pretty good. Um, you know, pretty 15 to 18 is yeah, the sort right. of total range, but you'll get most of the animals on 16, 17. Yeah, okay. Uh, so it's, it's quite reliable compared to other species, uh, sheep and cattle and uh, generally pretty tight yeah so our uh, teasing so obviously as day length's increasing spontaneous ovulation kicks sorry day length is decreasing spontaneous ovulation starts kicking in um yeah. and then teasing is less effective or zero effect well it has no effect once the animals are all cycling you, you're wasting your time i mean there are effects going on in the body in terms of hormones and things but you won't have any any synchronization or induction of ovulation uh, we, we just haven't figured out how to make that part of it work. It's pretty complicated and I think unlikely to happen. So basically then, let's just say you're a merino breeder, right, then you, you, you might expect the spontaneous season, the normal season of average cycles, to begin sometime in January, February, which means that teasing is really effective up to probably the middle of January. Yeah, right. Uh, you're pretty wasting your time. And then if you're in, you said merinos are the most responsive, but a Romney or a composite, um, are they like they are later when their spontaneous ovulation starts kicking in? Is like they they have a deeper anestrus. Does teasing have an effect, just not as strong on them? Or? Yeah, it does. So you know these animals can all be teased, yeah. um, uh, and they just become more resistant as you, as they become more seasonal. They become more resistant to the male smell, and, and, but they they become less and less resistant as they get closer to the start of the season. So, you know, if you're, if you're using a, a composite breed of some sort with some British genes in there, you know, you, you can expect uh, the breeding season to be delayed until, say, March, right? So if you go in near the end of February, you might, you might have a good teasing effect. Yeah, okay, yeah. What's happening in the is new lamb mating or what they call you hoggart mating in New Zealand, which is mating, mm-hmm. mating the lamb at 12 or 13 months? Um, and obviously, well, I don't know, we all recommend to tease them, and so... They are not ovulating, well, tend not to be ovulating, so you're trying to get through to those couple of silent estruses, same, is the same sort of process? The same basic process. So there you've got a sort of strange interaction between the season and the onset of puberty. So the, the male effect of teasing can induce an early puberty if the animals are sufficiently mature uh, in terms of their body mass and their body weight and their condition uh, and age, right? So all those things control puberty. And if you're getting close to puberty, then teasing can induce early puberty, which is exactly the same experience as you see in the adult use. So basically, you can you can you can help out the process there by using teasing and gain some traction in terms of getting an earlier first pregnancy. Yeah, right. Know. How long does it take for them to forget a male? We can. It's tempting to go into human analogies here, but we won't. We'll um we'll stick with the shape. But, <laughs> but so twelve months later, they that's a new novel smell. But but a month later, it's not. Or well, we don't really know. We think it's probably a couple of months. Um, it, it, they're actually really quite difficult experiments to do, and I haven't been able to convince the funding bodies to let me do it. So, so basically, uh, we think it's a couple of months. Uh, it's a really interesting bit of sheep biology, in fact, because what happens is that the female sheep smells a novel male, and then in her brain, she gets some cell division happening in the memory, and these cell divisions make these new cells make new memories. And then after a while, these cells die. We just don't know how fast they die and therefore how fast the memory disappears. And it's exactly the same process that a female sheep goes through when she smells a newborn lamb. Right. So, again, it's in the memory centers of the brain. The smell of the lamb makes the cell divide. She sets up a memory. And then, of course, after a while, she forgets which lamb is hers you know, after a year. We just don't know exactly when she forgets. So this process is something that's quite poorly understood. Um, but... You know, if you want to be conservative, you'd say a couple of months. Yeah. And so, obviously, best practice is to keep in this period, if you want to use the teasing effect or the ram effect, you want to keep 
all males on the property well away from where the user. Yeah, that's exactly right. So, you know, the, the fail safe is to keep them completely separate, right? Uh, knowing that there's novelty effectors involved. So, you know, so if you do that, then, then you've got a system that works. Yeah. I remember my father used to breed pod dorsets and he said, uh, Oh, you know, there's never a problem. He put the females in this paddock and the males in this paddock and they never saw each other. But the paddocks were next door, right? And he wasn't there. He wasn't there 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So he never knew what was going on, right? <laughs> yeah. So, you know, th- this is this is the risk uh, of not doing it carefully. And there's only a small number of males involved anyway, so you can you can keep them isolated on the average farm pretty easily. Yeah. Um, interesting to chat numbers. So does just one stinky tease it like some one one ram providing pheromones is that all you need or is there a percentage that you need or is it there's no you know you, you've got to think that the more smell the better yeah. um yeah. but generally speaking i think you're probably looking at just a couple of percent right because they wander around a lot of the place they're always searching out the use none of the user on the heat so they keep hunting and hunting and hunting and getting out and seeing everybody yeah right. so so i think those numbers are okay um you know, the more the merrier, but, you know, you can see, I can see the limitation there in terms of just management. When it comes to putting the entire males in there, that's when you've got to be careful, right? Because, uh, you know, if you're mating during the normal breeding season, then then the male, the ram, is going to see, you know, uh, one ewe and six coming into estrus every day, right? So 16% of the flock coming into estrus every day just on average. So that's pretty easy for the average ram to keep up with. Okay, if you've got a couple of percent, you've pretty got you've got good coverage. We know that that's what works in practice. Yeah. But with teasing, what happens is you're going to get three times as many per day, maybe four times as many per day in that period, right? Between uh, day seventeen, day, first day fourteen, and day twenty six or twenty eight. So in that period, there things are really concentrated, and if your ram percentage is too small, they just won't be able to get out there and get it all done. Yeah. You're going to have to actually bump up your percentage to probably something like three or four percent. Yeah, and all our ram selling listeners will be keen to hear that for sure. <laughs> but the, <laughs> the uh, ram buying ones, not so much, particularly this year, where they've been pretty expensive. But the um, yeah, I think that's a really great point. Certainly, one one listener will be will <laughs> that'll be. Really, I think for our yeah, for people who are single side mating, it's it's a really big catch if you're teasing and then single side mating. You've got to be really careful with your numbers. They're not going to cover the numbers that they normally would in a yeah, in a twenty-eight or whatever thirty-five day of mating, and maybe the way around that is to manage it in small flocks. You know, so you sort of keep things under control a bit. You just yeah. got to think about the poor body ram out there. You know, doing his best. Yeah, but you know, <laughs> when there's thirty sheep on heat in front of him, he's in trouble. Yeah, yeah. So you said um, at the start that the, is the intelligence of the sheep, and you don't have to prove that to me. But some people we do. How is yeah. an animal? How is a sheep working out? What are the signals that, that sheep's using to work out how whether how good things are, I suppose? So they, they, they definitely measure body condition, so they measure the amount of fat in their body. Uh, we also think now they measure the amount of muscle in their body, uh, and we think this is particularly important for puberty. We know that, that uh, female sheep come into puberty at about two-thirds of their, their adult body weight, and we've always thought that body weight, the, the two-thirds was fat, but now we know it's actually muscle as well. So they, they actually, the brain is actually measuring how much is going on in the body. They, they've got hormones measures just go up there to tell them how to do that. So they measure those things, and then when they decide that they can afford to be pregnant, uh, they they then get pregnant, right? You, you got to remember that, that for a for an animal like a sheep, which evolved over millions of years before humans came along and put them in the fields, right? That that they developed a process of reproduction for survival. And their biggest risk of survival in evolution is lactation. So if you get pregnant at the wrong time of the year or you, you get pregnant and your body condition is poor and you can't produce milk, you will die and so will your offspring. So they, they're really quite conservative about this. Uh, merinos are tougher than most others because they seem to be able to get, even with only skin and bones, they seem to be able to get pregnant. But down the track, lactation is the big challenge. Right? Uh, so they've evolved ways to try and make sure they're lactating when pasture's good and when the season is good and so on. So that's where we are. They 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 measure their body condition. They they also seem to respond really quickly to to uh, to supplements. So they suddenly see that a change of food supply feed supply has led to improved conditions. And that's why that's why um, uh, 
how would we call it? Flushing. Yeah, flushing works, that's yeah. right. Yeah. So when you look into something, they respond to that signal, you know, within a couple of days in the female sheep. And, and, and the male the male sheep, the ram, you should always, of course, feed the rams well before mating. Uh, the male responds to a, a lupin supplement within, within uh, about four or five hours. So four or five hours after things improve, their spermatogenesis increases, or what happens? No, what happens there is that the, the, the brain systems that control the testes switch on, uh, but the testes takes time to grow. Yeah, yeah, yeah? right. And the, the process of production of sperm takes about uh, eight weeks to change. Yeah. Well, you've got about an eight-week supplementary period before you've got a mating. So the testis is, a, is really full, full production. So in that eight weeks, yeah, you're basically building – up the machinery to produce the sperm, not actually producing sperm. That's what that's, that's right. what that eight week period is. Yeah, right. That's yep. Exactly right. Yep. Cool. Yeah, right. Excellent. Uh, it's a fascinating, fascinating area and something that we, I think, we spend most of our time talking about reproduction, and that's um, because everyone's yeah. everyone's sort of um, working to improve it. Um, I wanted to move on to, I guess, in the last maybe ten years, you've sort of been. Thinking about clean, green, and ethical, and and how you apply some of these concepts to or all the concepts of your career, I suppose, into into different whatever in different production systems. Um, so yeah, I guess your your vision for the future farm at UWA and and where clean, green, and ethical can go, and why it's important. Yeah. Uh, so so the background to that was that I don't know about ten or fifteen years ago, um, I, I sort of decided that if I found another cell in the brain of the sheep or another hormone, it wasn't going to save the planet. And so I began to uh, also be stimulated by colleagues around the place saying, "Graham, you've got to put this into action." Right. So I began to think about everything that we'd learned, not just me but other people around the world. We'd all learned about reproduction in sheep and how it operates, and, and I began to to look at that, and we. We, we also developed this pretty clear vision that, that sooner or later, right, uh, clean and green and ethical were going to be the key words for the future of all of our industries. Now, clean meaning less hormones and drugs, and less antibiotics. Green meaning more focus on the environmental footprint and clearly that's methane and chips, a big one for us. And then ethical meaning animal welfare. So setting up a production system which, which begins and then moves along through all of the stages of reproduction where you manage nutrition, uh, where you manage the male effect of the teasing if you can use it, uh, where you manage birth conditions for better neonatal survival and, and therefore postnatal growth, um, where you get all those things right. And when you get it right, you end up with a system where you need uh, less intervention from the outside. It's more natural. Um, you know, Some people say, oh, Graham, you've gone all organic. Well, it's sort of organic, but it's, it's organic with science. And not all not all organic in science. So, <laughs> yeah. so, uh, so we have these, these these parts of the process, and teasing is one. Right, we really worked hard on understanding teasing, so we can use that. The advantage of teasing uh, is that you get a synchronized pregnancy in the flock, not perfectly synchronized, but pretty good. Okay, it's not not as synchronized as you get if you use sponges or something. But you've got most of the animals in the flock, say sixty percent, lambing at the same time. That means you can then think down the track about what you do to feed the animals during pregnancy and prepare them for birth. You can prepare yourself for birth by making sure you've got a good birth site that's not going to be a tundra, right, and the lambs will be more likely to survive. So good birth conditions, good nutrition during pregnancy, and then after that, of course, you've got the synchronised lambing to manage as a, as a cohort, which is, which is a major advantage. So we saw that as really quite critical. And then, you know, in, in certain places, you, we've never got perfect nutrition throughout the year, but in certain places you can put in a supplement, uh, such as flushing, um, but also, you know, feeding for the last week of pregnancy to improve colostrum production, uh, which is a bit of a problem in merinos. Uh, if, and you can only do that if you know when they're going to lamb. So, you know, because if you, if you feed all three pregnancies, you have a gigantic lamb and dystopia and disaster. So you've got to manage these things carefully. But when you understand the process, you can see how you can do it. You know, come in in very ethical fashion. Yeah, awesome. Um, just a few more teasing questions have come into my mind as you've been talking. Yep. The uh, so if you are putting like we have got obviously people putting rams out in November and stuff in Australia, um, and so that you can just whack the rams in two weeks earlier because they won't be they shouldn't be spontaneously ovulating, and so you can just use the ram as a teaser for kind of for that job or. 
you can, okay? Now, the risk is, of course, right, that, as I said before, there's always going to be a few percentage of the flock that are going to be cycling yeah. and, and will get pregnant. Yeah. So it's a bit, it's a bit dangerous, yeah. okay, um, which is why teasers have that advantage of yeah. being sterile males effectively, right? Yeah. yeah. So they, you know, originally we, get, we were always using vasectomized rams and then we realised you could actually take weathers and inject them with testosterone for a couple of weeks and they'd do the same job. Yeah. We can probably even inject user testosterone. They do the same job, right? So, you know, I, I think this is something we haven't quite worked out now that weather's of this in our situation disappeared off the scene, right? Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, but keeping a small flock of weathers on the farm mightn't be a bad bad idea anyway. Yeah, I mean, just having teasers around is like you can pick them up. Everyone's got car rams, and you can get them vasectomized relatively cheaply. So it's not a it's not a major. Yeah. Very cool. Not a major yeah. impact. Um, yeah. Just don't get them confused with other ones. Yeah, no, you want at least three tags <laughs> in them, I think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Dye them purple or something. Yeah. Yeah, that's right, yeah. Yeah. We used to put a brand on the horns when we had horny merinos in those days. But yeah, so. yeah. They're, uh, they're like the weathers, mate. They're getting hard to find. <laughs> I'm so they should be too. Like, yeah. <laughs> um, back when I was in WA, I, th- I think your group were working on the visual cues, so sheep being able to differentiate between other sheep is that work in the is it all pheromones or is there some visual stuff going on with the okay so so it turns out that the sheep are actually really good at recognizing sheep faces Uh, and uh this is not our work it's a guy who was at cambridge university studying this and he could he could he could measure signals in the brain of the sheep that tell whether the sheep recognize a sheep face or not and he discovered that the sheep could measure could recognize at least 50 sheep faces for at least two years which is bloody remarkable when you think about it, right? And, and I don't think I could do that, not sheep faces anyway, but even human faces, right? So, so uh, you know, and, and um, it's at least 50 sheep faces in at least two years because he got sick of testing, right? It's probably a lot more than that. Yeah, I know. And, and this is, when you think about it, it's no surprise. The biology of the sheep is that they live in big flocks, okay? And they always have done. In evolutionary history, they're in big flocks as well, wandering around the plains. And so they need to recognise each other at a distance and especially recognise the ones that are going to beat them up. So that was done by facial recognition. Uh, so we, we thought, well, okay, if they're good at recognising faces, maybe they can recognise ram faces as novel or familiar. And there is a side input in there. That we, we think they can recognise ram faces and we think they can recognise the, the sound of a ram, but it's nowhere near as powerful as the smell. Right. Yeah, no way. Cool. So we just focus on this now. Yeah. yeah, right. On. Awesome. What's the What's the future hold for for Graham Martin now that you're not not teaching as much as you were and not travelling as much as you were? And I guess we probably should cover some of that. I guess those roles you had in the latter part of your career, moving around. That was working across a whole heap of different mammals on reproduction. Some pretty interesting ones. Yeah. So uh, because I because of my so sort of core core field is the, the way the brain controls a reproductive system and, and measures the environment and then tells the reproductive system what to do. Uh, I can apply that information to anything, uh, any other animal, including humans. So, but I, I did, I, I looked at that in terms of controlling reproduction in marsupials, kangaroos that were overpopulated. Uh, you know, you'll get overpopulations of kangaroos on golf courses and on hilly rocks in, in the middle of the farm where they become a real nuisance and nobody likes to see them all shot and just dying in the bush. So so I looked finding contraceptives for kangaroos was based around that same system. Same thing for finding contraceptives for dogs. Uh because you know you, sometimes you want your male dog to just bloody, you know, stop being a male and get on with work. <laughs> and, your, time, and, actually, and, and your teenage anyway. son sometimes. But yeah. Well, yeah, well. <laughs> <laughs> so, so um, but you know, if you castrate the dog, then of course you can't breed from it, right? So, having a reversible castration was was, was one of the things that we did. Uh, we did a similar sort of work for hippopotamus and rhinoceros and African wild dogs. So, we had a lot of fun uh, taking the same basic principle about how the brain controls reproduction and applying it to other situations. Yeah, right. that was that was, that was uh, I really enjoyed that. Um, just, just that expansion of the, the outside the boundaries of your normal workload. Yeah, yeah, no, awesome. Um, I'm chopping and changing all over the place, but our listeners are probably used to that. The, <laughs> the actual ovulation in the U, like obviously the switch to turn it on or off is you've talked through, but how many she ovulates? What are the, what are the, 
what's going on physiologically in in that. Okay, so the U has sort of two decisions to make, right? She makes one decision, which is to ovulate or not, uh, get pregnant or not. Really, is the, is the real decision. Okay, um, and then having decided to ovulate, she's got a second decision, which is how many eggs. Now, the decision to ovulate or not is done in the brain. Okay. Uh, and then later on, the decision to have one egg or two eggs is basically done in the ovary. I don't know. So, so the brain drives the ovary to develop a follicle and the follicle will produce an egg and that's ovulation. And then we get pregnancy because at the time of ovulation, the same hormone that causes ovulation also causes estrus. So those two things are synchronized by estrogen. Now, to have two eggs though, rather than one is, is interesting, right? Because we know that things like flushing, for example, can make, make her change from one egg to two eggs within three days. And that's just, you know, an amazingly risky decision to make. And I, I think what that is, is a, bit, a little bit of a, an, an artifact of, of, uh, of animal management. Sheep did not evolve, right? To, to sort of wake up at 8 a.m. and find 250 grams of lupins in front of them. Yeah. So it's a bit like a hormone injection. It's a bit weird. Whereas normally their nutritional planes would change on a fairly gradual basis, right? They might find a little pile now and again, but they wouldn't find it at 8 a.m. every morning. So, so that's what I call nutritional pharmacology. It's a bit like a drug that we're using to, to do other things. So we didn't take it, we need not take that as, as a, a realistic aspect of the biology, except that it does tell us what's going on in the ovary. So when the follicles are developing and they start little tiny guys, they get bigger and bigger and then they pop. The, the, most of the follicles die before they get to that process, before they pop. But you can change the rate of death by using things like flushing. And in some genotypes where multiple ovulations are more common, they also change the rate of death. They reduce the rate at which the follicles die, so more follicles survive. So it can change the, the survival of follicles with nutrition, uh, but there's an underlying genetic propensity, an underlying genetic driver that says they'll have two most often or three most often if it's some really weird gene file. So it's an interaction of genes and environment. As you know, Mark, that's, uh, that's where you come from. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, you know, no surprise, really. Uh, but, but it's this, what we discovered recently. I just had a, a workshop at the beginning of last year in Dunedin, actually, uh, just before COVID. And we were, we were actually bringing together the latest information from around the world uh, on how nutrition affects the, ov the ovary of sheep and cattle. And uh, we had scientists from USA and France and UK and uh, Australia, New Zealand, obviously. Uh, and so we published a paper later in the year that sort of brought all this information together. And um, Jenny and Jungle down there at, 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 uh, in Dunedin, at, at, um, she's at AgriSearch, right? She, and she was a senior author, uh, and she ran the workshop, did a great job. So so we're now beginning to understand this a lot more. We're also now understanding how the genes control this process of killing the follicles or allowing the follicles to survive and, and get more eggs through. So that's that's uh, it's, it's actually pretty unique to, to sheep to be so responsive. Goats are less responsive. You'd think they'd be the same, right, but they're actually not the same. Cows know. really hardly ever change, right? They're really resistant to going from one to two. Uh, so there's a long history there of, of issues in, in cattle tuning, of course, that have evolved process to prevent that from happening. Uh, um, I think the last question, the, the the next two weeks after that, after conception, obviously we've got embryos, implantation is, is until, until that happens, you haven't got a pregnancy. And yep. I guess, I don't know, I probably naively thought until some of like your colleagues, Carolina and and crew were really investigating embryo mortality. We lose quite a lot between conception. So a lot of we lose embryo mortality is a, a pretty significant number in, in some circumstances. Yeah. You did right. And, and it's a really difficult one too, right? The embryo is deep inside the animal. You can't really see it. You can't measure it until until you get implantation. Uh, there are hormones now that we can measure that, that are used commonly in dairy cattle industry. Um, but but uh, that's really difficult on a broad acre, you know, massive sheep operation. So so it's difficult to study. So it's difficult to tell when the embryos died. Uh, and so we often don't find out until the mum ovulates again. And yeah. she'll do that. If the embryo dies quite quickly, she'll ovulate a second time and, get it and have another go, right? 
But if she, if she, if the embryo stays until after the second ovulation was due, you might have taken the rams away and you've just lost everything, right? So it's an area where the percentage of embryo mortality is something we, we really, we, we're sort of always guessing at. Sometimes you think it's only 10%, sometimes we think it's 30%. If it's 30% disaster, if it's 10%, we're not even sure it exists. So it's a really difficult area to study. And for a long time, we actually had a, a hypothesis that, that if you overfeed animals, in that first 10 days after mating, that the embryo is more likely to die. Uh, and the, but now I think we're all, we all understand that the experiments used to generate that idea were fairly extremes of nutrition. Whereas with normal nutritional management, we don't think that's a big factor. Uh, so it's a complicated issue. Uh, and I wish I had a better answer. For you. Yeah. Well, um, is there any, like, say we bring the ewes in and shear them in that period or do we put some stress on them? Is that, that do we know stress what is that is? Good. Yeah. Stress is never good for reproduction. Yeah. Okay, uh, so you you need to wait uh, until well after you're sure about implantation. Probably you know after you've done the ultrasound, if you do an early ultrasound before you shear, uh, you you really do need to avoid it. And certainly don't don't stress them out really close to mating because that's really a bad idea. Both sides are mating. Yeah, stress is just naturally bad. Yeah. Um, I said that was the last question. I got one more. The um <laughs> the, the We've got a couple of examples where it seems like the male is controlling, well, we're getting more, a higher scanning percentage out of using a, a group of males versus another group of males used split on the gate. Obviously, they can't, the male's got no con, no control over ovulation, right? Is there genetic differences in embryo mortality that you're aware of? Oh, no, I... Uh, I can't off the top of my head think of a yeah. study. It's not something I've read a lot about. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, so males are an interesting aspect here, right? Because, you know, people who've, who've always used British breed animals, like I've had colleagues have been Suffolk breeders, right? Friends. And they always talked about syndicate mating. So if they wanted their Suffolk to get pregnant before Christmas, they just put a whole heap of rams into the ewes, right? They really swamp the, the ewes with rams. And then they get some animals getting pregnant well out of season. Uh, and that's almost certainly teasing. But sort of, you know, a sort of forced teasing by just having so much male intensive signal that the females almost had no choice. So, you know, I think those sort of things can work, okay, depending on the genotype you're using. Yeah. Uh, and, and some genotypes of males are far more effective than others. I think Terry Knight did a lot of that work in New Zealand way back in the 1970s, showing that uh, certain, certain genotypes of rams are more effective than others. And that's no surprising, right? If you've got a highly seasonal genotype like a suffolk for example then the males are also very seasonal and they won't be producing a lot of this magic odor if they're out of season yeah so they do crank up there they stink more as they're getting closer to breeding like yeah theoretically i, I didn't see it as a stink myself but you know that's, no, yeah. that's more <laughs> yeah. interpretation <but> mine. <laughs> provide odor whatever yeah <laughs> yeah, you got yeah. It. yeah awesome Graham. really appreciate your time it's been a fascinating chat and i'm sure the, the listeners out there are going to really enjoy this one so um yeah appreciate your time thanks for a really really fruitful career for um, i think wa is very much punched above their weight for contributing to, to the science of sheep reproduction and and you're obviously a key part of that so yeah thanks for all your efforts and look forward to look forward to what what comes next thanks mark it's been great fun chatting cheers mm -hmm.